The focus of this panel is to look at the local actors or the local agencies in African states and how they uh, play a role in the making of the Build and Road Initiative project in Africa. Well, I think everybody in this panel knows what the BRI or the Build and Road is. And in fact, the Chinese government defined the BRI in a very functional way, supporting basically any international project that can have a potential to become part of the BRI umbrella. So there is no concrete definitions of what kind of cooperative engagement there should be. And this opens the door to many possibilities Encourage, encouraging interested stakeholders in many parts of the world to justify their projects to be part of the BRI and thus can obtain Chinese investment or Chinese loans and uh, expertise. So by our panel, we want to problemize uh, the concept that Chinese state is the most important, if not the only variable in explaining the success of BRI projects. I think what is better needed is really an examination of the motive, the actions, and the resources of uh, stakeholders in various uh, BRI uh, states or potential BRI states that will receive the, the Chinese investment. And uh, we have, I think if I'm right, we have around uh, five speakers today. Uh, I mean, five papers that will be presented today. I think um, I kind of reorder it and apologize for this. I think we can let Maria and William present first. So their, their presentation will, will be about adaptive governance along Chinese finance BRI railway mega projects in East Africa. And after Maria and William, uh, we will have uh, Elisa and Frank. I, I'm not sure, sure if Tim is here with us today. And uh, their projects to look at uh, the BRI in Eastern Africa, the polymorphy of African agency in infrastructure development. So that will be the second paper. And then the third one will be uh, Obe Hosi. He will uh, talk about actor agency and localization. So the making of the BRI uh, project in Africa. So that's Obe. And the, okay, actually four. Then the last paper, if I'm right, will be uh, with uh, Avery. Uh, she will talk about BRI in the Middle East and North Af Africa, a panacea for authoritarian regimes with a question mark. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Yusus, uh, who have submitted to a paper, uh, kind of uh, abstract to the panel, he will not present. And I think Arua, Oko, or Maka is also not here, right? All right. So, so I think I get the order right now. And uh, Maria, maybe you can go first. Thank you. OK, thank you. William, do you want to start presenting? So we divided the task. OK, so. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. OK. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. And it's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be here. So thank you for taking the time to listen. Uh, today, I'll be presenting our research, uh, my research with Professor Karai on adaptive governance on Chinese finance BRI railroad mega projects in East Africa. And so to start, debt trap diplomacy, neocolonialism, these are some of the words that have been used to describe Chinese investments in Africa. There's a famous quote from President John Adams, the second US president who said, there are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword, the other is by debt. And so what we're really asking today is an overarching theme to think about, are such allegations true? Is it debt trap diplomacy? Is this neocolonialism? Now the questions and methodology for our paper on adaptive government we're really asking, do Chinese economic actors on the BRI raise the bar for corporate social responsibility or going beyond what is requested of them, or do they lower it? And we're defining corporate social responsibility as businesses generating wealth for shareholders through ethical policies and sustainable management practices like economic viability, positive social impacts, preserving the environment, and overall sustainable development. And our paper focuses on three case studies, three specific railways in East Africa, Kenya Standard Gauge Railroad, Ethiopia's Addis Ababa Djibouti Railroad, and Nigeria's Lagos Ibadan Railroad. And we're really looking at this question of whether China's development financing model is seeking to present a new alternative development financing model to the Western model, one that is based on good governance, high standards, rule of law, and social and environmental responsibilities. So some background on China's CSR regulations. 
these really became more of a priority for the Chinese government in the 2000s with its going out policy, and that accelerated with the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. So China president presently lacks an overarching law that governs these activities, but it has emphasized the importance of higher regulatory standards. And we see that with different ways in which CSR was included in Chinese laws in 2006 and 2008 guidelines encouraged the publication of CSR reports. And 2017 was probably the best year for Chinese CSR performance. Between January 1st and October 31st, 2018, Chinese enterprises released nearly 2,000 CSR reports. But there are some flaws still. The language remains vague and broad and difficult to translate into concrete objectives. And many Chinese representatives from Exim Bank and China Road and Bridge Corporation, CRBC, seemed remarkably unaware of CSR regulations when interviewed and asked about them. So let's start with Kenya, the case study of Kenya and Kenya Standard Gauge Railroad. Uh, we see Kenya has a really well-developed legal system and regulatory framework, especially regarding environmental laws. And it also has detailed labor laws and a lively civil society. And this really impacts Chinese CSR because we see Chinese actors are creating a public relations office giving interviews in English using social media platforms that are otherwise blocked in mainland China, like Facebook, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter, publishing a CSR report online. They also prioritize local hiring. And so they hired not only lots of local non-skilled workers, but also reserving senior positions of leadership for Kenyans when often, more often than not, these positions would be going to many Chinese people. One incident really is reflective of Chinese CSR on Kenya's standard gauge railroad. Uh, in September 2016, Kenya's National Environment Tribunal actually issued a stop work order after a Kenyan environmental NGO protested or filed a complaint about the SGR running through Kenya's Nairobi National Park and potentially threatening wildlife there. China Road and Bridge Corporation, the SOE working on this, then shows a different route that bypassed the park, and they adopted a, quote, animal-friendly design as a result. And so we see that complaints about Chinese CSR by local civil society, by NGOs, can result in a change in Chinese behavior. To move to the next study of regulations in civil society in Ethiopia, Ethiopia has relatively well-developed environmental legislation, an increased regulation of collective labor rights, but a less robust civil society. Ethiopia has adopted some of the internet behavior of China in blocking platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And so as a result, this impacts Chinese CSR. Uh, given Ethiopia's weaker civil society, the public relations efforts of the Chinese companies working on the railroad are uh, less sophisticated. And in large part, that's due to the fact that they're less active on social media because they're unable to use it because these platforms are blocked. And there was also quite a long time before uh, the Chinese company CCECC released its first comprehensive CSR report, report on the work, um, not until December 2019 did that occur. But yet given, as mentioned before, Ethiopia's increased emphasis on labor rights, we do see China Railway Engineering Corporation prioritizing local hiring. They hired over 20,000 locals in Ethiopia and 5,000 in Djibouti. And the third and final case study of Nigeria, Nigeria's Lagos Ibadan Railway. In Nigeria, we see weaker regulation of CSR principles, but a vibrant civil society uh, a long-standing tradition of a free press and active NGOs. And as a result, Chinese CSR on the railway is, um, there is a clear effort to project a positive social image, especially on its so English language social media presence, which has over 160,000 followers on both Facebook and Twitter. Again, both platforms are not used in China. CCECC issued a CSR report. It created a university designed to develop Nigeria's young talent in the transfer se transportation sector, really emphasizing uh, the ability of locals to rise up into leadership positions. And that's what this post from January 15, 2021 is getting at. It's a profile of a young Nigerian graduate who joined CCECC Nigeria as an intern. 
and then rose the ranks into a leadership position. And the, really the message is that uh, local Nigerians can build their future with, with Chinese firms. We also see that um, CCECC assisted Nigeria with its COVID-19 efforts in dispatching Chinese doctors and medical equipment. And again, prioritizing local hiring with 8,100 Nigerians hired, but also not only non-skilled positions, but also skilled positions with 180 Nigerian engineers. And so to conclude, we find that Chinese SOEs in all three case studies overwhelmingly adapted to the local context, what we describe as adaptive governance. It's important to note though, this adaptation can result in either weaker CSR, weaker CSRs and weaker than Chinese government guidelines or stronger CSR, stronger than the government. And that could potentially be in European countries. That remains an open question. Um, but, but the bottom line is the key to CSR success or failure rested in the host country's regulations, their institutional frameworks, and the vibrancy of their civil society and the ability of civil society to express an opinion on these projects. And to get back to the question about the development financing model, if China is seeking to export and create a new development financing model, it definitely remains in progress. It remains in a nascent phase and it's primarily adaptive. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the very concise presentation of your uh, actually very well studied paper. I thought maybe we can let all the presenters uh, make their presentation first and then we can post questions. Is this okay? Yeah, so uh, maybe then we can move on to the second uh, presentations. Frank and Elisa, is Elisa here already? Yeah, I think she should be here uh, in a moment. But then right. I'll start, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, uh, if you all confirm you're seeing the presentation. Yes, I've seen it. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending where you are. My name is Frank Chemura. I'm a lecturer at the Open University um, in Development Policy and Practice. Uh, so, Today's presentation comes from uh, some of the work that I've been doing with my colleagues, um, Elisa Campino, who will join us in a moment, as well as Tim Janus, unfortunately, who could not be with us today. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, infrastructure development and um, the politics of African state agents. Um, here, we are more or less interested in understanding how African um, state actors, particularly uh, exercise agents when dealing with the Chinese um, infrastructure development in Africa, I mean, with a specific focus of uh, East Africa. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of background and the aim of the paper, and then go on to do a bit of uh, some work around the built and road initiative uh, infrastructure, as well as the role of the state um, in Africa. And then we present our analytical framework, which guides um, our paper, um, and then obviously move into our three case studies, then um, the conclusion. Uh, so infrastructure development um, has experienced uh, political renaissance, particularly in Africa, um, with some scholars sort of commenting this idea of the re-enchantment re uh, with big infrastructure, where infrastructure development is seen as uh, a driver, is again seen as a promoter of development. I think this comes from these beliefs and this assumption that you can only drive development uh, in these respective countries by investing in infrastructure. And unfortunately, you know, most of African countries, they do not have adequate infrastructure. And some of these infrastructures were actually inherited uh, after uh, the end of colonialism. And to some extent, you know, they, they are not sort of suit for purpose in terms of promoting development um, in Africa. But again, this mainstreaming of infrastructure, you know, particularly seen as an enabler of development has also led to mobilization of financial resources from uh, different sources. And um, I think as of uh, 20, 2018, you know, we have seen about yeah, close to uh, you know, 100 and 110 mil billion dollars being mobilized for infrastructure development. But again, you know, this, this, these resources which have been uh, mobilized, you know, they are again considered as inadequate. And according to the African Development Bank, they think that Africa still has uh, an infrastructure financing deficit of between 68 to you know, 108 billion um, uh, per year. 
So given this so-called infrastructure financing gap, you know, we have seen that you know, the Chinese actually are increasingly playing um, a, a role as one of Africa's largest um, uh, bilateral financiers uh, for infrastructure development. Uh, recent information that we have um, from Infra Infrastructure Consortium for Africa suggests that as of 2018, I think Africa had re re received about 100 billion and Chinese contributions to us that was about 25.7 uh, billion, which is roughly about a quarter of infrastructure financing in the continent. But again, we have also seen that infrastructure has become the main pillar of you know, Africa-China relations. And you know, because of this, there's growing analytical interest uh, by several scholars um, trying to understand the engagement, engagement modalities as well as the impacts of Chinese um, involvement um, in, in Africa's uh, development of infrastructure. So our, our study particularly is situated within the so-called um, um, African, uh, African Agents 10, where we are trying to understand how um, African state actors precisely in the context of Tanzania's planned Bagamoyo port, uh, as well as Ethiopia's Adama wind farm and Kenya's um, Lamo port. So we're trying to understand how do African state actors at these different um, uh, governance levels interact with the Chinese and how do they shape um, uh, the terms and condition of, 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 of these projects. So by the end of this presentation, we aim to show how African state actors shape the development of infrastructure projects with Chinese uh, involvement in different ways. And in doing so, we're trying to make a case for what we refer to as a context sensitivity analysis of various spheres of African state agents, in particular, at those uh, conjectures where the Chinese and Africans meet. Uh, so our exploration in this paper, I think draws from some of the primary work uh, that we've been doing in, in, in Ethiopia, in China, in Kenya, uh, stretching as well as 2017, you know, uh, of course, coming from um, field work as well as interviews, as well as uh, participant and uh, ethnographic observation in some of these sites uh, involving the Chinese. Uh, the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in, in 2013, to some extent, uh, some scholars have commented suggesting that it might provide uh, the required uh, financing which Africa currently lacks uh, precisely for infrastructure development. Uh, but I think um, we, we have to acknowledge that um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative is sort of becoming all-encompassing or all-catching uh, initiative to some extent that some of the projects which were actually initially uh, uh, um, you know, uh, developed or designed by African leaders. Um, so, for example, if you look at the uh, the Lamu port, um, uh, the Lapset or Lamu port, South Sudan, Ethiopia Transport Corridor. Uh, this was an initiative which was actually done by the East African governments. Um, but now, all of a sudden, is now also part of the of, of the Belt and Road um, in, initiative. But I think we have to acknowledge as well that, you know, given the proliferation of relations between Chinese and Africans, you know, infrastructure definitely is playing a pivotal role. And um, recent, recent studies or recent reports actually estimate that, um, um, you know, the Chinese contractors are winning um, about 42% um, some of the World Bank tenders in Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, we have seen a number of you know, uh, uh, Chinese companies being contracted to develop about 40, close to 42%. Um, so this seems to suggest that indeed the Chinese are actually playing a, a very important role in developing Africa's infrastructure. I think crucially the Chinese in financing in most cases again has sort of been referred as to, you know, no strings attached um, where the assumption is that the Chinese financing in most cases is preferred to by African governments uh, because of you know non-governance conditionalities or no political conditionalities, you know, as, as sort of a, a determinant of uh, dispersing or, or contract awarding. But I think we, we need to be careful when making such kind of uh, you know uh, uh, statements because I think recent studies again, for example, the one by Hillman, which suggests that the Chinese exim bank at the moment at least requires about seventy percent of some of these um, uh, uh, contracts actually uh, contracts procurement to be to be to be from China, and we have also seen that you know. If you check at all, all sort of the, the Chinese funded projects, you know, they are all developed by, uh, by the Chinese uh, uh, enterprises. They could be state owned enterprises and other and state uh, actors. And I think we've seen that recently about 89% of all, you know, Chinese funded projects have all been implemented by, 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 by Chinese uh, conductors. So as infrastructure becomes the main pillar of Africa-China relations, I think um, uh, most scholars now are beginning to question like, you know, what are the engagement modalities? What are the financing terms and conditions? 
And in most cases, you know, questions of who benefits and who uh, the, the, the loss is there, and they have also come to the picture. But equally, you know, as the proliferation of relations um, continues, some people are also starting to question like, you know, to what extent and how much do African um, state actors actually influence the terms and conditions? So, so today we are specifically going to, to focus on, um, on, on what we refer to as three spheres of, of African state agency, where we are looking at African state actors in their respective context and how they uh, influence the engagement modalities with the Chinese. Um, analytically speaking, we do, we do consider African agents um, as basically the ability of Africans um, that this could be acting as individuals or as collectives, you know, to shape their engagement with the uh, external actors in ways in most cases seen to advance and safeguard uh, their interest. So our focus here basically is on the state um, for obvious reason in the sense that uh, the state is sort of plays a, is playing a pivotal role in provision, uh, regulation, operation um, of countries, um, um, of any African country, or rather any country's infrastructure development. So I think it is important to focus our analytical or our attention on, on, the, on the role of, of the state. But our understanding of the state in this regard is sort of rooted in um, sort of a social relational ontology of seeing the state as an institutional assembly where our assumption is that there are um, uh, a number of actors, or state actors and institutions that are firmly embedded in sort of the wider structural context of the society. And when these actors do act, in most cases, it is um, in recognition of these wider uh, social, forces, social and political forces operating within that given um, uh, structural context. So for us, the state is thus to be understood as something which is dynamic, uh, something that is multi-layered, and you know, and there, of course, of this because of this multi-layeredness, there are a number of some institutional capacities as well as liabilities, which promote to some extent as well as constrain the ability of the state to exercise power. I think we do sort of also agree and sort of go with uh, Hagman and Patlard's idea of um, uh, understanding, particularly the African state is sort of very negotiated and it's always in the process of constant, uh, of, in the processes of change and there's always a deconstruction and, nego uh, and negotiation by various actors um, at different arenas and, and, and tables. So for us, a new one's understanding of African state agents in the context of China-Africa relations must therefore acknowledge uh, the, the multiscalarity and the multifacetedness of the state. And as, as Don Bos um, suggests, you know, to account for the manifold moves and efforts made at local, national and international level aimed at arriving at new, new forms of, uh, 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 new forms and organizations of, of, of public authority. So in doing so, we respond to recent studies calling for the need to uh, you know, uh, pay particular attention to the contours and the specificities, specificities where African agents is um, one way or the other being exerted by particularly African um, actors. So we focus on three spheres of uh, African state agency. Of course, our focus on three does not mean these are only, there are so many um, other spheres that people can explore. So our first sphere basically is that concerned with African state actors uh, who are located um, at the top echelons of state power. And um, uh, this is because among other reasons, we believe that state leaders play a pivotal role in defining as well as in mediating uh, external expression of state preferences. And our second analytical uh, sort of sphere here is um, what we refer to um, uh, that of bureaucracy, you know, African actors, which we may uh, broadly refer to as bureaucracy. And of course, bureaucracy is not, a, is not a narrow definition of what we expect in terms of functional purposes, but we also understand these people or these actors precisely as government officials. Uh, to some extent, these could be civil servants as well as technical and administrative experts. Uh, we believe that such actors um, uh, have various forms of institutional and regulatory power and they are able to exercise control over the processes as well as the outcome of negotiations, negotiations with the Chinese, basically in according with their country's national regulations. And the third sphere which we focus on today is on African state actors, uh, basically at what we refer to as the local governance level. 
So basically, at the local governance level, we assume that in most cases, that's where the uh, infrastructure projects are actually implemented. So our aim here is to try and understand how do actors at that particular governance level impact uh, or shape the way they, uh, the Chinese uh, develop their uh, infrastructure projects. So I'm just going to quickly turn over to um, Ellie. Um, Ellie, are you around so that you can uh, begin our uh, case studies? Is Ellie here? I'm not so sure if she's here. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. I can I can just then um, uh, continue. So as I was saying, I think the first sphere for um, where we believe African state actors exercise agents is that of the actors located at the top echelons of the uh, of the state. And here we have in mind, you know, the um, uh, the Bagamoyo port here, uh, where we are looking at the role played by uh, President Magufuli when he came into power in 2015. Um, so so so. Um, indeed, as we, argue, as we argue, state leaders play a pivotal role in defining and mediating external expression of state interest. And we have seen that when President Magufuli came into power in 2015, um, when he sort of tried to revise or revise the negotiation, in particular around the terms and conditions of the Bagamoyo port, um, which had initially been agreed in 2013. So just sort of a back note to this, he came into power from a populist developmentalist economic uh, model where he was sort of chanting this idea of anti-corruption. And again, you know, he was sort of of the idea that um, the way the Bagamoyo uh, port deal was structured was not um, helpful and did not reflect the interest of the uh, Tanzanian people. And to an extent that he publicly denounced the terms um, proposed by the uh, China merchant, um, in, in doing so, you know, ended up sort of leveraging what we refer to as state agents by pu publicly shaming uh, the Chinese uh, investors. But for him, he was saying that this Bagamoyo port, you know, should be developed in a way that it ensures that there are linkages with other in, uh, sectors uh, at, at the end of the day, contributing to what he referred to as productive investments uh, in other sectors. And again, he was also not uh, happy with the way uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, merchant sort of retained, uh, had proposed to have a sort of control on the, on the port, as well as having control on the, on, the, on the custom. So because of this, then he ended up declining um, uh, some of the proposals which uh, uh, had initially been agreed with the previous uh, Tanzanian administration. And again, he also ended up sort of uh, declining what the previous administration had agreed on, uh, for example, this far reaching tax holidays, as well as the stabilization clauses uh, regarding other port developments. So, so our, our understanding of Bagamoyo port here clearly shows that um, uh, those leaders at the, at, at, at the top echelons of the state have got the ability to exercise agency and you know, by controlling as well as expression, uh, uh, expressing the interest uh, of, the, of the state. And then our second empirical case study is um, that one of um, Ethiopia's uh, Adama Wind Farm, where we are looking at what we refer to as procedural state agency. So the second, uh, the second sphere is that of, uh, as I had said earlier, bureaucrats interchangeably understand as government officials. At some extent, this could be technical as well as administrative experts. And we believe that uh, we need to focus on planning um, because in most cases, you know, uh, um, as, 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 as identified by one of our interviewees that um, um, the first arena through which uh, African actors can really exercise agency is around um, the planning and as well as controlling the planning processes uh, for developing these infrastructure projects. And one of the Ethiopian government officials clearly highlighted at the early stages of the project that, uh, I mean, if you fail to plan, definitely you're planning to fail. And as he said, it's high time, we really need to take care of our infrastructure development um, uh, processes. So in reflecting around Adama Wind Farm, you know, we, we can essentially say that uh, the Ethiopian state, especially I think after 2005, um, had been characterized by uh, what some other scholars refer to as authoritarian uh, developmental state model, um, where in most cases development um, was governed using what the so-called refers left-wing policies and ideologies in which the top leadership of the party in this regard, which is uh, EPRDF, had monopoly and had control on uh, the state as well as in the government in different governance levels. And to, to be honest with you, Ethiopia, like rest of the African countries, you know, 
they have a, a huge uh, population without access to electricity. And, you know, the Ethiopian Ministry of Water, Irrigation, and Electricity, I think as of, I think about 2004, 2005, say that uh, we need to develop and we need to harness um, uh, the, the, the natural resources we have to, such as wind, solar, to develop our own um, uh, energy security. But in most cases, they said that they did not have adequate data to carry out uh, feasibility of developing these wind farms. And um, because of that, we saw the Ethiopian government sort of, you know, lobbying um, to, to, to the United Nations and um, to several other multilateral founders looking for information um, around, you know, what potential do they have in terms of uh, resource endowment. So this resulted in Ethiopia being selected as one of the African countries to participate uh, in, a, in a UN funded project, which was referred to as um, uh, solar and wind, wind energy resource assessment uh, module. But again, the way the, the data that they, they got from that uh, Aswera project, you know, uh, was useful in the sense that then the Ethiopian government approached uh, the Chinese government uh, looking specifically for financing to develop these, um, these, these wind farms. And um, because again of this data now, then the, the, the data was used to uh, plan or model the development of wind farms, and even to an extent of going to the Chinese asking for financing, as well as technical advice around which projects basically would be suitable to develop first. And we see, we saw the, the Chinese government actually going an extra mile, even uh, proposing to do what they refer to as them, uh, the, the solar and wind master plan of, 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 of Ethiopia. So this resulted in identification of about um, uh, 51 sites which were suitable for development of, of, of wind farms. And out of that, you know, we had about uh, three which were selected and at the end of the day, the Chinese were invited to, uh, to, to develop um, uh, the wind farms. And as one of the Ethiopian government officials highlight here is that um, although we were collaborating with the Chinese in many sectors, uh, the selection and prioritization of uh, wind plants was actually an, an Ethiopian um, uh, um, initiative. So, so what we can read from particularly this, um, uh, the, the planning around the Adama wind farm is this idea of degree and of control over development priorities, as well as this control over which projects to go for, leading to the Ethiopian government officials then to broker the engagements um, uh, with the Chinese. And then our third and final case study is that of uh, Lamum. So here we are specifically looking at the role of uh, um, uh, actors, uh, the local actors in shaping how uh, projects actually implemented, uh, how Chinese uh, projects actually uh, implemented. But I should highlight here that the interesting case about the Lamu port is that um, uh, this project is not financed by the Chinese, but there are some Chinese contractors who are actually uh, implementing it. But for those who may probably not be familiar with the, uh, the Kenyan um, history, is that um, uh, for some, what some scholars argue is that uh, Lamu and to, to a reasonable extent Northern Kenya has historically been sort of marginalized um, in, in, in Kenyan um, economic uh, development and to some extent even the political history. But what we should ident what we should highlight here is that uh, uh, given the the the, the constitutional uh, reform where now you know they became the Lamu become part of what they refer to as the uh, the county government, and then there was this sort of push towards development of infrastructure with the idea of promoting connect connectivity and integration uh, between different and across uh, various um, uh, regions of Kenya. But the interesting bit is that um, in most cases, this uh, contestation, you know, has also been used in some of the projects involving the Chinese um, uh, to some extent. So political and business elites who are always at the center, um, uh, they have been involved in acquiring land for, 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 for these projects, but there had been contestation in the sense that local interest around development of this, of this, pro, uh, of this port were not sort of um, uh, recognized. And there have been cases where the local um, uh, local here were sort of resisting this, and uh, to an extent that um, you know there's always been sort of the you know uh, the contradictions fighting in fighting and you know involving the, the Chinese on one end, but equally involving the Kenyans. So we'll have some contestation between um, uh, let's say the local governments as well as the central government, and in most cases the Chinese are always caught in between this um, uh, this these contestations. And I mean, by clearly looking at the Lamu port, what we can say here is that um, 
uh, govern, uh, local actors here, they have some ways of shaping the way these infrastructure projects are actually implemented. To some extent, even you know, with the idea that you know, this project, then they should benefit um, uh, the local. But then it becomes so much sort of involved in politics in terms of what is defined as local, who becomes the local um, in such case. Um, uh, in terms, in terms of um, um, sort of uh, discussing uh, what we read from uh, from these three case studies, uh, precisely around the role of African state actors, is that um, uh, first uh, in the Tanzanian case study we have seen that um, this idea of what we refer to as a developmentalist state agency, where the incumbent president, uh, the late unfortunately uh, 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 President Magufuli, um, had to sort of cause an impasse in the negotiations to an extent that. Um, 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 uh, the, the project actually was uh, was sort of uh, suspended, and the idea here was that Magufuli was calling for what he referred to as the win-win narrative, um, and for him he was saying that if there's no win-win narrative in developing this project, then there is no need for us to continue um, uh, going with the project. So Magufuli's populist developmentalist agenda, leading uh, government officials, including the president himself, has, has sort of pursued uh, what we consider as a confrontational strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the Chinese uh, uh, investor, which ultimately led to the suspension of, of the negotiations. The Ethiopian case study reveals that the political at the same time and the governance structure of the Ethiopian authoritarian developmental state model allowed the exercise of agents by um, uh, strategically uh, centralizing as well as controlling uh, the planning processes as well as the project initiation and the police space around which the wind farms were developed. The case of Kenya, uh, Lamu Port showed that in addition to reframing the center periphery relations, the agents of local governance in reshaping engagement with Chinese contractors has contributed to exercise of agency soon through the negotiation and always renegotiation of the need to include the local interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis to those of, for example, the central as well as the national government. So by capturing these contours and uh, specificities of agents, uh, which links uh, actually cause for uh, our context sensitive analysis underlines that there is need for analytical sensitivity towards the mode scalarity, as well as multifacetedness of African state agencies. We believe that maybe our empirical case studies, um, of course they are three and distinct, but we have at least managed to show how African actors shape uh, the built and road projects, uh, while at least as well simultaneously shaping uh, their own respective political, social, as well as economic and institutional uh, context. So I'll end here. Thank you. Uh, Elisa now joins us. Yeah. And I'm thinking anyway, uh, we should still continue with the presentation. So the third presenter is Orbet Fozzi. Orbet, are you ready? Orbet? Yes, I'm ready. Let me just share my screen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about actors, agents, and localization, and what I think is the making of an African Belt and Road Initiative. Okay. I'm going to talk about Dolowitz and Marsh's Police Transfer Framework and try to use it to see how we can understand how African actors, particularly political elites, because I focus on political elites, are trying what they are trying to transfer how they're trying to transfer from the Belt and Road Initiative and why they're transferring those things. I'll end with looking at the impediments to BRI transfer from China to African countries. So Dolowitz and Marsh's model, basically they, they, I like that definition of what police transfer is because they look at police transfer as the process by which knowledge about policies, administrative arrangements, institutions and ideas in one political system, past or present, is used in the development of policies, administrative arrangements, institutions and ideas in another political system. Their argument is that most of the times when you talk about police transfer, we're thinking about voluntary police transfer, where actors in one political system uh, sees a policy that they want to implement in their own system and then they voluntarily initiate the policy or the process of police transfer. But they argue that they are also cohesive. There is also cohesive police transfer. Well, because of conditions that have been set, 
and Africa is not um, is is not new to conditions being set. The structural adjustment programs, for instance, this was policy transfer that was to some extent coercive. So actors being forced to, infor, to you know to initiate the process of policy transfer and then implement certain policies that they would otherwise not have been able to implement or not have chosen to implement. Mm -hmm. And the um, cohesiveness that just doesn't come with, you know, it also comes with some conditions being attached. Uh, conditions where uh, if you want a BRI project, for instance, you have to um, give 70% 70, 70 as, as Frankton was talking about, a certain percentage of, of, the, of the business has to go to a Chinese company or materials that are used should come from China. So this can be to some extent coercive in some way because given a choice, African actors would want to source the materials from wherever they want to source them from. But most importantly, Dolowitz and Marsh's model allows us to ask five questions. Why do actors engage in police transfer? Who are the key actors involved in police transfer process? And what is being transferred? I think that's one of the most important questions because sometimes you talk about police transfer and not necessarily really talk about what exactly is being transferred. And how is the process of police transfer related to police success or failure and what restricts or facilitates the police transfer process? In this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on four questions. Who are the key African actors in the BRI transfer process? Why are the actors engaged in the transfer of BRI? And what aspects of the BRI program? Is it ideologies? Is it institutions? Do they see the BRI as a program or as a policy? So what exactly are they transferring? And what is the degree of that transfer? So to start off, I think we need to understand and uh, again, I'll refer to, to something that uh, Frank John talks about when he talks about the state of African, of um, the state of Africa. I'm going to talk about the state of Africa in this way, that uh, this graph or table um, uh, to, my, to my right, it talks about the best model for development. And this is a survey that was done by Afrobarometer in, in 18 countries in 2019 and 2020. So African respond or respondents in these 18 African countries were asked, in your opinion, which of the following countries, if any, would be the best model for the future development of our country? Is there some other country in Africa or elsewhere that should be our model? And 32% of those respondents say that the United States provides a better model for their countries. 23% say China. 11% said former colonial powers in South Africa, other countries. And for me, the interesting part of this is that only 7% of respondents say that their countries should follow their own country, that they should follow our own country's model. So it shows that only 7% of people who are surveyed think that their country can develop its own model. And that is the state of Africa really from colonial times to post-colonial times, Africa has been exporting or importing rather development models from elsewhere, either voluntarily or, coerced, or being coerced to, to follow certain models. Kwame Nkrumah said that its economic system, and just referring to Africa in general, he said its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. I think this um, it to some extent is something that um, is common really when, when you hear leaders speak. Joe Biden recently was talking about build better, build back better. I think and he was basically talking about poor countries that they need to help to develop and say, right. And when you talk about many different structural adjustment programs or development policies or development strategies that have been implemented by the World Bank, by IMF, and even conditions that are set on donor funding from the EU, from many other countries, it really to some extent proves what Kwame Nkrumah was talking about, that Africa's economic system and its political policy is normally directed from outside. Kyohane talks about system ineffectual countries, countries that can do very little to influence the system-wide forces that affect them. 
And when you look at them, when you look at Africa's GDP, its military spending, its ability to handle crisis, for instance, COVID, you actually see that this, this, this is a continent that to some extent is system ineffectual. It doesn't really change much of the system. Wole Soyinka, his Nobel Peace Prize laureate here from Nigeria, and he says that Africa is a warring ground of world's traditional and emerging hegemonist. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But all in all, what we see that is Africa that is being portrayed as passive, as important, as lacking of agency, and as ineffectual. And there are many examples that we can give to, to some extent show that Africa is to some extent passive, important, or lacks urgency, or is ineffectual. However, if we, okay. if we look at the African state, if we look at African countries' GDP, if we, you know, the aggregate GDP of African countries is slightly more than the South Korean one, less than Brazil less than France, less than Germany. And to some extent that shows you that African, when you don't want to look at the state, you see the state as ineffectual, as important as lacking agents. But what I, what I argue is that we need to shift our attention towards political elites because these political elites, to some extent exercise more influence and more agency than their states are able to exercise on their own. And they exercise that agency on because of several reasons. The first one is that African actors from the Cold War up to today, they see themselves as middlemen between their populations and the outside world. And they use that ability to speak as the middlemen of their populations to articulate, to conceptualize what the interests of their people are and to speak about that. In most cases, it is basically their interests that they are articulating. And there's a symbiotic relationship between the political elite and transnational business interests. One of the things that you see when you look at Angola, when you look at many different countries, is, is the fact that there's that symbiotic relationship between the political elite and transnational business interests, including Chinese businesses. And then the third thing is that they are key actors in determining which external policies can be implemented in their countries and to what extent. Even when they are coerced to implement certain policies, they still determine to what extent those policies are implemented. One of the reasons why the structural adjustment programs failed is because some political elites, for instance, um, uh, Arab Moy in Kenya, in Zimbabwe as well, and in some other African countries, they try to implement as little in order to get as much benefit for very little implementation of policies or conditions that were given to them. And they still exercise that influence today. They still exercise that power today to implement the least in order to get the most benefits. So they determine which external policies they implement and to what extent they implement those policies. And that includes the Belt and Road Initiative and all the things that we've been talking about, about, um, about um, our Chinese uh, projects in Africa. And the most important thing for me is the fourth point, which is that they strategically localize policies to meet their domestic mm -hmm. politics or to their domestic political objectives. So you can see the differences between political leaders when there's a change of political leadership from one leader to the other, and the policies change. Um, Franklin talked about Tanzania. The shift, you know, the change of leadership to Magufuli really shifted things, you know, for projects that had already been implemented. In, in Sierra Leone, exactly the same thing. So one political leader coming in and uh, renegotiating contracts that had been made by the previous leader and trying to set their own conditions. And in most cases, they are mostly considering their own domestic political interest or to some extent their external interest. So why are these actors and who are these actors? I'm going to talk about three, perhaps two actors. I'm going to talk about Paul Kagame. And I'm going to talk about Paul Kagame because he brings in 
a very interesting concept. He looks at the Belt and Road Initiative as a concept. So he said the Belt and Road Initiative is a very good concept where each country involved finds a place for its own development in areas like industrialization, infrastructure, and the green economy. The progress made for all players has been so far so good. We'll continue to play our own role to make sure we contribute to the overall development framework. So the most, you know, um, he, he looks at the Belt and Road Initiative, not as a project, not as an ideology, but as a concept. And that means that if he looks at it as a concept, is exactly as he said, that each country then finds a place for its own development in the areas that are covered by the Belt and Road Initiative. And Calabrese talks about the Belt and Road Initiative as fluid, an ever evolving concept that has changed considerably since it was first announced in 2013. And if Paul Kagame is looking at Belt and Road Initiative as a concept, what he's basically saying is that this is, an in, this is a concept that we can adapt, conceptualize and operationalize in our own context to suit our own developmental strategies and our own mm. developmental needs. And he says that each country then um, decides it's the place that it's going to play and how it is going to play that role. And by looking at the Belt and Road Initiative as a concept, he's basically claiming agency and saying, we have a right to, you know, we can um, conceptualize it the way that we want and make it suit the interests that we want and, and save um, our local needs. So because this is a fluid concept, you know, you can look at it as a global infrastructure development strategy that provides the, book, the blueprint on how infrastructure gaps can be reduced. You can see it as an ideology and there's some countries that are seeing it as an ideology. Zimbabwe is one of those countries. Seeing it as an ideology is a new, new form of global development anchored on China's national values and priorities. And again, the difference would be that in Zimbabwe, they're basically looking at the relationship that they have with the Western countries, sanctions being imposed on them, and then looking at the Bolton Road Initiative as an ideology representing what uh, um, uh, global development that is anchored on China's national values and priorities can look like, where there are no extreme political conditions that are being attached or structural reforms that they have to make before they implement or they uh, benefit from the Belt and Road Initiative. And then Paul Kagame then talks about what he calls the development framework and what is this development framework that the Belt and Road Initiative uh, represents. Uh, in some cases, he talks about he talks about uh, develop economic development um, uh, without necessarily um, undermining your sovereignty, choosing your development path, choosing how you want to develop, and then peace and security. Or it can be looked at as infrastructure development project, as I shall talk about um, uh, Ciro Ramaphosa just about now. So the intention, intentionality <clears throat> approach then links agents and intentionality. In this case, what is the intention that Pokagami has? And what he basically wants is to be able to define what the Belt and Road Initiative and how it will be implemented and understood in his own context and how they can use that to meet their own objectives, as, as he rightly pointed out. Cyril Ramaphosa looks at it differently. He, he looks at it from an instrumentalist perspective and looks at Belt and Road Initiative as a source of support. He said that Africa is looking forward to continued Chinese support in pursuing the objectives and priorities outlined in the African Union's Agenda 2063. And at that time, when he said this mm -hmm. statement, he was the chairperson of the African Union. To some extent, Cyril Ramaphosa represents the view that the majority of African elites really hold. They see the Belt and Road Initiative as a source of support for their own infrastructure development projects. So in other words, the Belt and Road Initiative is nothing more than a new financing model and improved credit for them. So it's infrastructure development without demands for structural, economic and political reforms, as was the case with um, uh, support from the United States and the European Union and other countries. So what it basically means 
is that what is being essentially transferred are the projects linked to the policies and there's very little in terms of transfer of ideologies or looking at it at the Bolton Road Initiative as a concept. It is purely a new financial model, right? And African actors use the Bolton Road Initiative to secure their own interests by leveraging support from key states or partners in the international arena. So the Bolton Road Initiative, if we look at how Cyril Ramaphosa uh, views it, is basically reduced a financial instrument for which they do not need to derive any police lessons or transfer any policies or any institutions or anything else. The same way that if you go and borrow money from the bank, you don't need to implement any policies from the bank, right? So the Boat and Road Initiative is just one of those uh, financial uh, um, support that, that is available amongst many other uh, sources of financing. Now, this is something that I think, that I think um, Joe Biden brings to the fore when he talked about the Build Back Better World Partnership, the geostrategic approach to the Belt and Road Initiative. I haven't really seen many African countries or many African actors talking about it from a geostrategic approach. But um, Biden brings in this idea that um, the Belt and Road Initiative is a development strategy or an ideology, you know, which is a strategic threat to the liberal global order into the interests of the G7 countries. Therefore, there has to be a response to it. And G7 countries have to respond by something that is totally different or opposed to the Belt and Road Initiative. How will this work for African countries? I think it's yet something to be seen and it basically depends on how successful the Build Back Better World Partnership will be. But in some extent, it divides the world into, you know, it, it, it brings this tension that there are two kind of Belt and Road initiatives as, as, as however they are, they are understood by, by African actors, but it is opposing elements. That on one hand, you have the Build Back Better World Partnership, which represents transparency, democracy, good governance, and all the values that the G7 countries, particularly the United States represents. And on the other hand, you have a proposing a Belt and Road initiative, which is, a threat to, to, to the liberal global order. And how, and then what is basically going to happen, I think, is that African countries being forced to choose in between these two, to choose between these two. Whether they will choose or they'll take another approach um, is, is something to be seen. Now I'm concluding. So what is basically being transferred? So if we look at it as a new financial model and improved credit, then the Belt and Road Initiative is just another source of financing and there's no need to transfer anything. If you look at it as an infrastructure development, as long as it is being seen as a source of financing, as a source of you know, developing infrastructure and covering the gap, infrastructure gaps in Africa, then there's very little that is going to be transferred, all right? But it also includes, you know, the MOU that are signed between the uh, China and the African Union talks about trainings and exchanges in science, technology, and innovation. And perhaps this is where we might see certain institutions and certain skills being transferred to African countries, security assistance programs, and international cooperation to improve existing international legal system. And perhaps this is where competencies can be transferred in legal institutions can be transferred and to some extent. But at the moment, none of these are really emphasized that much. The most emphasis on infrastructure development and the Belt and Road Initiative as a new financing model that can help Africa to cover its gap, in its infrastructure gap. What are the impediments? The first impediment is basically how it, the Belt and Road Initiative is understood by African leaders. If they understand it as a concept, then they might be able to transfer certain elements that meet, you know, or depending on, on, on their context that are needed in their context, or what some others will talk about as domestication of the Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. or strategic localization of the Belt and Road Initiative. If they look at it as a new financing model, then there's very little that is going to be transferred. Or if they look at it from a geostrategic perspective, then that means that they will revert back to 
uh, implementing the least to get the most benefits out of it. But three impediments that I want to talk about. The first one is an asymmetry of information. So the Belt and Road Initiative has been very fluid. To some extent, there's not really clear transparency on what exactly is the Belt and Road Initiative. Is it a project? Is it a policy? Is it an ideology? What exactly is it? And what projects fit into the Belt and Road Initiative? The expansion of the Belt and Road Initiative to cover pretty much every project means that some projects, there's no difference now between previous projects that were being implemented by China and Africa and the Belt and Road Initiative project. And because of that lack of clarity on information on what the Belt and Road Initiative, it basically leaves African actors to pick and choose what their Belt and Road Initiative is and how they understand and how they will implement Belt and Road in, in, their, in, in their own context, or even try to justify why they should be considered for Belt and Road Initiative projects if they see it as a new model of financing. Linked to that, because there is an asymmetry of information, what it basically shows is that there's also an asymmetry of expectations. The expectations on what the Belt and Road Initiative is supposed to achieve and for whom it is supposed to achieve that. Is the Belt and Road Initiative supposed to cover the infrastructure gap in Africa? Is it supposed to provide financing to African uh, infrastructure projects? Is it supposed to be a framework of development or a development strategy or a development policy? What exactly is it supposed to be? And because they are these, you know, because of lack of that clarity, then it means that the expectations are different. What some expect the Belt and Road Initiative to achieve in Africa is not what it is intended to achieve. Right? And the third one is the asymmetry of competence. For you to be able to transfer, if you think of it as a concept like Paul Kagame, if you look at it as a new financial model, if you look at it as a strategy or as, as a framework, for you to be able to transfer it, for African countries to be able to transfer it, they need to have the institutional and structural capacities and competencies to be able to transfer it. And if you look at the statistics, um, you can find many different statistics on, on the state of, um, of uh, technological scientific advancement in Africa, the amounts of money that are allocated pay as a percentage of GDP towards research and development, uh, bureaucratic competence. If you compare the bureaucratic competence in China and uh, in, in some African countries, there really is a big gap. And because there's that big gap, and Africa itself has been struggling with its own major infrastructure development projects that haven't been really implemented fully, even though they've been going on for many years. Because of that lack of capacity, um, you know, particularly bureaucratic capacity to implement massive continental infrastructure projects, I, I, I see significant challenges to, to how it can, be, it can be transferred. So in conclusion, what I can say is that the Belt and Road Initiative is a China initiative, not a joint initiative of African China, as some African leaders would want their populations to believe. Therefore, Africa participates in the Belt and Road Initiative to the extent that its participation enables China to realize its two cent centenary goals, the Chinese dream uh, and the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. So it's purely a Chinese project and African countries are being incorporated into that project to the extent that they fit into, into China's uh, own objectives. And that then speaks about the asymmetry of information and then the asymmetry of expectations that I talked about. So I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Obed. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Evering Gomus from Turkey. She will talk about BRI uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Evelyn, are you ready? <laughs> yes, I am. Let me share. Sorry. Okay. So like um, the title of my paper is Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative in the Middle East and North Africa. So like it will be a little different from you guys. So like we'll be going to the Middle East a little bit, but um, my focus will be on North Africa and Egypt. And uh, uh, subtitle of my uh, 
paper is a panacea for authoritarian regimes. And in my paper, actually, I tried to provide a political economy analysis of the BRI and uh, by analyzing it within the local political and economic context of the Middle East and North Africa. And I, I, my paper conceptualized uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative as a state-led special fix in a particular form, which reorganized um, external economic space by linking markets producers by multiplying and controlling transregional and global value chains. And if I try to summarize my main um, argument here, um, I argue that in my paper, the process of reorganization of China's centered economic spaces offers a panacea for authoritarian regimes and failed to bring promised development to the region. Ruling elites use public funds and state assets for their own interests and allocate lucrative contracts to their business or uh, security cronies in the authoritarian settings of the Middle Eastern countries. And I use, as I said, Egypt as a case study to illustrate how the authoritarian regimes utilize Chinese engagement to create new rent sources to the repressive state apparatus in uh, seek seeking to secure their authoritarian system sustainability. If you try to summarize uh, Chinese relationship with the Middle Eastern countries, actually, we need to refer this uh, comprehensive one plus two plus three uh, comprehensive cooperation strategy published in 2014, where energy uh, represents the core and the other infrastructure uh, construction and trade and investment are seen as the links that support that core. And with this emphasis, actually, uh, uh, in 2015, China became the largest oil exporter of, for, of the Middle East, and Chinese total trade volume in Middle East increased by 87% between 2005 and 2009. And in 2016, China became the largest investor in the Middle East with a total investment uh, of almost 30 billion compared to 7 billion by the United States. And currently in, uh, in 2016, by the figures of 2016, um, 10 Middle Eastern countries became the members of the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank. And the total share of Middle Eastern countries in the bank increased to 11.04. Uh, Percent. And 17 Middle Eastern uh, economies are currently listed in the BRI. And our case, uh, Egypt, actually uh, is ranked the second highest number of BRI linked projects by volume after Russia. And also, Saudi Arabia uh, is um, quite important in that respect in the Middle East. So like in Egypt, of course, when we say Egypt, uh, Suez Canal, and Suez Canal is quite crucial for the implementation of the BRI uh, project where, uh, it function, where it function as the main transit point between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. And, you know, the CIS region as a like, former uh, military general uh, tried to uh, strengthen the power of military to, uh, to be backed and also to repress societal opposition and etc. And, uh, and he was uh, looking for simply money to fund uh, his own uh, national uh, projects, mega projects. And the regime successfully used this recent acceleration of Chinese engagement with the region. And so kind of like to finance the na national mega projects. And Chinese development mod model kind of like uh, quite fits and welcomed by Sisi regime in seeking to achieve economic growth and stability rather than, of course, freedom and democracy. And um, China soon became one of the largest investors for uh, regime's military-led infrastructural projects in Egypt. And here are some figures like Chinese direct investment in Egypt increased 66% in the first quarters of uh, 2019 and amount to 74.9 billion dollars. And as I said, so like um, CIS region tried to enhance military's image, image as the promoter of development and progress. And while doing so, 
it allocates new sources to the Egyptian military economic complex, kind of like it's also very important for the regime's survival. Uh, to be backed by the military, of course. And a number of uh, law needs to be um, mentioned here. Some amendments um, strengthen this uh, army agency called Armed Forces Land Projects Agency. agency. Uh, it was given the right to form joint ventures with private sector with national and international capital, uh, capital uh, sources. And the next one happened in 2016. And that uh, amendment give, gave this uh, Armed Forces Land Project Agency to form public limited company to manage the construction of new administrative capitals to that, which we'll be talking in a minute, and Sheikh Mohammed bin Said city. And um, public tenders and auction, auctions law was also amended, and uh, through that amendment, civilian ministers were allowed to assign public construction to military constructor through the system of it's not Mubashir. And uh, the engineering authority of the armed forces was then assigned to undertake CISI's uh, ambitious mega projects like Suez Canal extension and etc. Also, uh, military-owned business, uh, businesses were equipped with various privileges, such as tax exceptions or non-tariff barrier to trade. For example, uh, this like all military-owned businesses were extended from the uh, well, value at tax. And this is the uh, expansion of Suez Canal project and a Chinese industrial development uh, TEDA has been building the second phase of this project, and it was designed as the, an industrial and logistic hub to attract more international investment. And 30 billion had been invested since uh, 2015, and 75% of investment belonged to China in that project. And some other projects that China uh, undertook and uh, under, uh, still undertakes in Egypt, some uh, three so solar power stations in Aswan, and uh, this coal-fired power plant on the Red Sea coast, and also like this uh, pump stor storage hydropower plant in Mount Ataka. But I think the most influential one, uh, one is this, the construction of the new capital city. Like it was like, it can be seen as this is his most ambitious and prestigious uh, project that was introduced in 2000, uh, 2015 in Sham and Shah conference and uh, so like it's somehow like it's such a giant project it includes uh, 100 districts and 21 residential areas uh, in, um, containing a new government quarter diplomatic missions and etc and also the tallest building in uh, Africa uh, will be in that uh, complex as well and it was uh, it was uh, introduced as the new city will be seven times bigger than Paris or 12 times the size of Manhattan. And it was also uh, said that uh, the new city will reduce the con congestion and overpopulation problem in Cairo, and then uh, will be host 5 million people. And the, of course, it's such a like, giant and expensive project and not only uh, one foreign investor will be enough maybe to uh, fund the project, but the uh, so administrative in administrative city, there will be this central business district, which is being uh, built by the uh, by China, and it's uh, expected to be completed in 2022. And so, like um, these projects can be uh, seen as. Uh, not uh, benefit, beneficial for the ordinary Egyptians, right? Um, they do not offer any solutions to long-standing and big and deep development problems of the Egyptian populations. And the vast majority of the Egyptians are excluded from the benefits of the projects, but they are uh, being paid the debts, they're burdened by debt repayments. And uh, when you look at the figures, actually, the like figures are quite alarming, and the ratio of debt to GDP significantly increased over the years, and it reached ninety percent by the end of the two thousand twenty. And through this regressive taxation system, low and middle income taxpayer 
are disproportionately burdened by debt repayment of foreign and domestic loans plus their interest. And so like that's why poverty rate increased dramatically uh, from 32.5% uh, in 2018 to 27.8% um, in 2015. And also the level of consumption keep uh, decreasing in urban as well as the rural areas. So like, um, so like I argue that this um, in a more detailed way actually, this um, projects, that driven mega projects and kind of like prestigious uh, military-led uh, uh, infrastructure projects by uh, the Sisi region failed to yield promised development goals. And it increased the uh, economic and financial fragile, fragility in Egypt, but it strengthens the core group of like, uh, regime supporters, mainly the military. And in a conclusion, Egyptian case uh, contributes further understandings about the ways in which the BRI has been practiced as a relational and contested process in different localities. And of course, more empirical research is where to reveal this uh, tight uh, mixture between development projects financed under BRI and the um, authoritarian and political economic structures across various geographical settings. Thank you. I assume this is the last slide, yeah. So thank you. And I have seen a lot of conversations in the chat already. Uh, we have four presentations here. And if you may re recall in the beginning, I said the focus of our panel is really on the African agency. Apparently, you know, agency does not operate in a vacuum. It has to operate in a structure. So there, there is a relationship here between the state and the agency. And I realized that in, in the four presentations, I think our presenters have focused on different aspects of agency, or you kind of define agency in a very uh, in a in a different way. I, I want to have a discussion with uh, our four authors here to see if uh, you know if we have a consensus here. I, I realized uh, in the first presentation, Maria and Williams presentations, um, it seems that the agency you're looking at, in fact, is the structure, is the legal institution there in uh, the study countries and also the civil society. So you're comparing uh, some countries are, are more vibrant, others are not. So it seems that, in fact, you lead us to think about the structure of the society. That, that is the first presentation. And then when, if we move on to uh, Frank and Lisa and Tim's presentation, um, it's I think Frank does give us some definition that he thinks that state is a, some kind of institutional ensembler. And, and then, uh, so it's kind of a set of institutional capacity and he's looking, uh, or they are looking at the local govern, governance level. So um, I, I guess you, you are talking again, you know, if you talk about institutional ensembler, in, in fact, uh, when we talk about, you actually refer to the structure again, it's the structure, isn't it? So this is where I, I want to have a conversation. I think that we have a different understanding here. And then if we move on to Orbit, and then the last speaker, Avery, um, I think both of you have a strong emphasis on the, in fact, it's not the state itself, but it, it's the political elites uh, who dominates the discourse and who decides whether to proceed with BRI or not. Um, and the, so, now I, I kind of see the differences here. Is, do, you, do you understand my, my question? Is that they, there is an agency, but then in fact you are referring to the structure. And then some of you look at the institutional framework, some of you kind of in fact direct us to think about it's only the elite that matters or that they are the, the most pivotal player. I wonder if you have any thoughts here, um, like any of our speakers, how do you, situ how do you situate agency and structure? Well, I think um, if I may start us off in this discussion, I think that um, one point that we do uh, talk about more in depth in the paper um, is this idea of having a multi-layered and multifaceted, uh, multifaceted idea of the state. So thinking of the state as an ensemble uh, doesn't, uh, we are considering different aspects that make up the state 
and how they uh, relate and are inserted themselves and are embedded in the broader uh, social, economic, political, legal uh, context. So that would be broadly the structure. So the idea here uh, for us in our paper specifically is to look at different um, spheres of state agencies. And so that's why in the three case studies, we look at different um, moments and different uh, instances of agency. So we look, yes, at the agency of political elites, so the apex of the, of the political structure of, uh, of uh, countries. So in our case, is the case of Tanzania. Um, and then in the case of the Adama wind farms in Ethiopia, we look at the sphere of the, uh, the bureaucrats and the government officials and uh, so different uh, aspects of, of the state. And then uh, the agency of local governance um, looks at uh, the local level and different local actors that span from the local county government, but also communities and community representatives. So here, the idea is to kind of go beyond uh, the idea of the state as one, as acting as an agent, um, and to, um, not to use a sentence that has been used plenty of time, but to disaggregate it and look at different um, agencies, government agencies, but also different people, individuals and collectives within the state that uh, act and enact their agency. So there's specific um, officials that can be located at different levels within the state, or it can be political elites or local governance. And so the idea here is um, that uh, following what Mohan and Lampert already discussed in their 2013 paper is that Sino African relations really have as much to do with African politics and uh, specific aspects in terms of the agency, agency structure relationship within a specific African country than they have to do with you know, China and Africa and international relations. So that's uh, at least where we start from in our paper and sort of how we think um, through the agency structure conundrum. And Frank, if you want to add something, uh, feel free to jump. Feel free if anyone wants to jump in. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, this is just uh, some, something that puzzles me, but it's okay if you don't have an immediate uh, response to this. Because I see in the chat there are a lot of conversations, and uh, some of them has been answered already. So I see the one that has not been answered. So there's a question from Patricia to Orbit. Um, Patricia, do you want to post the question orally yourself? Maybe that's more exciting and interactive. <laughs> yes, sure. No. Oh. Um, so I'm in Copenhagen, but uh, in my computer, so maybe. I don't know if it's kind of weird if you hear my echo. So, however, I was really integrated over by your um, presentation. It was very refreshing and insightful. But this morning in the keynote lecture, Professor Lee mentioned um, several examples from Hong Kong and also Zambia. And she mentioned this example that um, apparently the Chinese managed to get in the secondary school curriculum Mandarin language as um, foreign language. So I was then kind of, um, I, I couldn't really embed that in the presentation you showed to us. So this didn't really seem to me as a pure financial investment concept where the African leaders can choose, you know, pick and choose what they want. So I would be very interested in get your feedback on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know much about that specific case, but uh, but what I can tell you is is that um, the process of involve of including a language in a national curriculum is not a process that um, uh, states can just take for no apparent reason. Right? I agree with you. They 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 are reasons why they, they have taken it. And part of the reason I would imagine is that they want to be seen as more aligned to China, as favorable to China, as building people-to-people -people relations with China. And that comes with a lot of benefits 
that comes with, um, I think you, you might understand that there are a lot of Chinese small scale traders in, 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 um, in, in Zambia. There have been some tensions in Zambia as well. President Lungu has been very good in some sense at trying to protect Chinese interests in his country, including banning a Kenyan professor who speaks against Chinese investments. And he's going to all those lengths in order to, obviously, because he sees the financial benefits that come with being aligned to China and what is the best way of showing that we agree with what China is doing or we want to build our relations with China beyond just political relations. And language is, is, is an important tool. Uh, I, and, and it's not just China that uses language as, as a tool to build relations with a particular country or to bring these ties. Um, if I can give an example of myself, I got a scholarship to study in Germany and part of the condition was that I have to study German and be able to speak German, right? And why are they telling us to study German and to speak German when we were going to be taught in English? Because language is a tool. And part of the reason why China talks about people to people exchange and bring people to study Chinese language is that if you are able to study Chinese language, then you understand the Chinese culture. And then you become to some extent more understanding to Chinese thinking, Chinese culture, Chinese language and Chinese way of doing things. And hopefully you become an ally of China in some sense. And, 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 and that's, what I can, that's what I can think from that case. So when I say that um, uh, Paul Kagame looks at the Belt and Road Initiative as a, as, as a concept, I'm not saying that it's exclusive. I'm just of I don't know. That are being talked about. I will put my mind that no matter what I'm uh, Sorry. Do we have a, a question from the audience? Can our assistant help? Yeah. Uh, sorry, Obe, have you finished your, yeah, yeah. sorry about yes. interruptions. So, yeah, Thank so you. seeing it as, seeing it as a concept is not exclusive of, you know, of, of other things. Uh, there are many political economic interests that are also tied to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that uh, Komra asked a lot of questions, and I wonder if Komra wants to uh, kind of orally, you know, make some comments here. Komra? Perhaps, okay, not, okay, but uh, you can see the conversation in the chat, or maybe, uh, I don't know if uh, Elisa or Frank wants to kind of orally explain your responses to his questions about this. Um, the case and also the one China policy, Elisa and Frank. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'll take the the question on the uh, sort of the rhetoric on the uh, non-political conditionalities. I think what we were saying here is that uh, I think most of the African leaders tend to believe that there are no political conditionalities associated or linked with Chinese um, financing. I think in most cases, you know, uh, given the experiences of most of the African uh, countries, the conditionalities usually are around governance, good governance to be precise. You know, you need to be at least showing some commitments towards good governance in order for you to be able to access uh, financing from the West. Uh, of course, including issues to do with um, uh, human rights, you know, I mean, in various forms of these rights. So in most cases, these are used as determinants uh, for uh, uh, financial assistance disbursement to African countries. But what we have seen to the contrary is that uh, African leaders actually consider that China do not offer this. And yet in most cases, you know, they have this the so-called one China policy where in order for you to be able to get or receive the financing uh, funding from the Chinese, you need to at least observe uh, that there is but only one China. Of course, we have seen the repercussions of this with some of the uh, countries um, which are not, uh, which do not observe this. So, so for example, um, Eswatini, you know, it's one of sort of an outlier there. Of course, it continues to have uh, the uh, relations with uh, Taiwan. Um, so, of course, I mean, you could say uh, um, um, you could say that the Chinese they do not offer conditionalities, but that is not the case. But I think most African go governments or uh, leaders are prepared to accept that one China policy than accepting 
uh, let's say good governance or maybe human rights discourses around around that. But beyond the economic, uh, beyond the polit this sort of one China policy, I think people also, in particular African leaders, make mistakes to assume that the Chinese they do not offer some economic conditionalities. I think evidence is showing that, for example, the China eggs in bank in order for you to sort of be um, um, uh, uh, given a uh, financial system, then you need to agree and accept that 70% uh, procurement coming from China. Again, we have also seen that if uh, the, China, the financing is coming from Chinese, uh, from the Chinese institution, then you know, the contract actually has to be implemented by a Chinese enterprises. In most cases, a state-owned uh, enterprise. Uh, you know. So these are a vi a various or American ways in which the Chinese uh, offer conditionalities. But I think African leaders are prepared to let it go than really going the governance, good governance and the human rights um, uh, conditionalities. If, oh, yeah. yeah. If I may add something to what, to what Frank said. Uh, what, what makes China different is that the, the one China policy is not just for African countries. It's for all countries that it deals with. Right, and it has been part of the dispute with the United States when it recognizes Taiwan and all. So, which is very different from the conditions like a structural economic reforms that have to be implemented where the IMF actually sends people to see if the governments have changed their economic systems and things like that. So that, that, that's a major difference. However, I think that Zimbabwe some, to some extent shows the extent that China can come in putting certain conditions. Um, I don't know, Frank, you might, you might have heard this, this, this um, story that was going around that because Zimbabwe was failing to pay its loans to China, the Chinese requested that they second their um, Chinese officials to the ministries in Zimbabwe that are managing Chinese funding. And the second thing is that when, when Robert Mugabe um, nationalized all the uh, diamond mining companies, including a Chinese mining diamond mining company, the, um, the, the ambassador of China in Zimbabwe complained and said that Zimbabwe was not abiding by the conditions that had been set, that if there is any dispute between a Chinese company and the Zimbabwean government, the dispute is not resolved in courts, but it's resolved diplomatically. Now that's a condition that you wouldn't find with many other countries, right? But it's, 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 it's an important condition that actually touches the, the real stuff that, that, that the Chinese business is, is doing. So I, I, think, I think that in as much as China doesn't put all these conditions that you need to change your governance system, you need to change your political system, it finds way of still achieving what the US and EU is trying to achieve by changing an economic system. By working together with China, right? Thank you. Uh, well, I see in the chat that Comra posed a question and basically he's differentiating um, the BRI projects or just non-BRI project, but rebranded as BRI. And this reminds me of a question that I can ask perhaps uh, Frank and Elisa in this um, LAMU project. So it's, it's not financed by the Chinese, but Chinese are taking part. So this is basically a non-BRI project, but perceived by the Chinese as BRI, as I assume. Is, is it? Uh, I just want yeah. to clarify the nature, yeah. Yes, so um, uh, interestingly, the entire corridor, transport corridor that the Lamu Port project is part of, the Lamu Port South Sudan Ethiopia transport corridor called LAPSEC, um, has become a strategic corridor catalyzing connectivity, I think is the, the, the name, uh, during the Belt and Road Initiative Forum of 2019. And that was also the case for the Northern Corridor stretching from Mombasa port in Kenya through Uganda uh, to Rwanda. Um, so I think here we have a clear example of projects that have not been initiated by Chinese uh, actors, uh, either state actors or, or companies, nor um, uh, projects that are financed by Chinese actors, but then are then 
grouped and bundled under the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so this is a, it's not a, quite an uncommon uh, phenomenon, and it is something that often happens uh, across sub, uh, Southeast Asia as well. Um, it is something that uh, we have witnessed also in the Bagamoyo Park project, which was initiated as an investment from um, a Chinese state-owned operation giant, and then eventually rebranded into Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so there's plenty of examples, not just across uh, East Africa, but broadly, um, I would say, uh, generally in, uh, in other uh, regions of the world, which are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but I think this just fits within a trend of the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, starting from a connectivity initiative focused on infrastructure and then expand, expanding to different sectors, expanding geographically as well throughout the decade, throughout this past decade. Uh, so really, I would argue that this is uh, something that has become very common. And um, in a forthcoming chapter on the uh, African Transport Corridor book, which will be out at some point this year, uh, I do talk about this phenomenon more specifically. Um, shamelessly self-advertising here, but uh, yes, and talking about uh, generally um, similar trends and how these um, different types of projects and different cross-sector projects are being inserted in the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think that um, it's really important here to you know, go back to the question that Albert was also discussing in his presentation. So you know, what is the Belt and Road Initiative really? Um, and who is uh, now, um, you know, and is the Belt and Road Initiative created by all of these projects and actors that are slowly rebranding and relabeling re the Belt and uh, projects as Belt and Road Initiative, or is it more of a Chinese driven approach of relabeling projects actively? Uh, so that would be a very interesting question to tackle in the future. And perhaps Maria would like to add something because I know that the project you wrote about in your paper is also now a Belt and Road project. So. Yeah, in fact, I exactly have the same question for Maria and actually every, you know, like in, in your case studies, do you notice which one is really BRI and which one is kind of non-BRI but rebranded? <laughs> I wonder, Maria and Ma Evering, would you like to answer this? Yeah. Hi. So I think that it doesn't even matter what is really BRI, what has been rebranded as BRI, because like even if you look at the history of BRI, when it was launched in 2013, they rebranded already then a lot of projects that were not BRI, but then all of a sudden were included in the BRI. And I don't think that very many projects have been really made as like just BRI, like and. And also here you can see the agency like of host country, right? So it's not just China that is trying to uh, rebrand things and doing it BRI, uh, but also the, the host country, right? That they see funds coming in from China and this BRI that there used to be a lot of money. I think now that there is, a, we, are, we are witnessing a decrease of funding that is quite serious, I think, from actually already 2016, and the pandemic has just accentuated this uh, this trend. And and I think from both sides, like you know, there was this idea of like rebranding things as a BRI, uh, and, and and rather than just conceiving it as a BRI. Right project. I mean, I think it, it unites a lot of different interests, right? And then we add the BRI, right? And it's done uh, uh, from both sides, both from Chinese side and and uh, and host country side. But again, I don't think it really matters because we don't know clearly what BRI is. So there is a definition, but uh, uh, does it really matter? And the fact that even China doesn't have yet, as for now a place or a website where at least uh, all the BRI projects, uh, I think is indicative of the fact that who cares, right? Whatever can fit in uh, becomes, you know, this can be a BRI conference, right? Uh, we can we can <laughs> make it a BRI conference. So yeah, that, that's, that's my point. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. In fact, Frame put in the chat at the end of the day, what is not BRI? And I think that shows quite well the reality. Uh, uh, I have seen many things being branded BRI, not just infrastructure projects. You know, like now we mentioned Confucius Institute or even a, a chess competition exchange between two, two uh, partner cities can all be branded as BRI. <laughs> yeah. Even, um, uh, 
if I can say another thing, even uh, when, when we did this um, uh, edited volume on BRI, I have a colleague that uh, wrote about casino uh, in, uh, in, a, in uh, that was branded as BRI. It was really considered as a BRI project. It's kind of, you know, why casinos? And, and it was later rebranded as, as a BRI project, just to say, I mean, how everything can really become a BRI pretty much. Yeah. Evelyn, would you like to say something also about right. this? Right, I think my answer will be very similar to Maria's. So like uh, for CC regime, I guess it doesn't matter either whether it's BRI or not. It's kind of like he repackaged them as like military led China backed national projects and then kind of like emphasis always is on military and national and mega. So like it doesn't matter that much, I guess in my case as yeah. well. Thank you. I see that Conrad raised your hand, right? Conrad. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I really want to, to get their clarification. If they are arguing that it doesn't matter, then what the need of having BRI? Because we have to differentiate. What I know, before the, 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 the China introduced BRI, it have already signed a PIDA project with the, Pan with the African Union to construct infrastructure, which part of it is lipset. So how do we today discuss something that was there and call it a BRI? Are we not making the same mistake China is doing, especially for us who are doing analysis? That's what I wanted to, to get them cleared because for an ordinary person, you think that is BRI, but what I know Bagamoy was there before even BRI was introduced. Then how does it today become a BRI project? And I think we have to be critical so that we send a message as academician that the way BRI is pro projected is not a proper way to project things so that maybe China may respond by coming out with more proper BRI project. Thank you. Thank you. Ope, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, I, agree, with, I agree with Conrad. I, I think it matters why something is called BRI and, and, and there's a thinking behind it. So for me, important questions are, why is a project which was not a BRI project now being called a BRI project? And who is rebranding it? And why are they rebranding it? I think there are many ideas that go with, well, the latest thing that captures China's attention is the Belt and Road Initiative. Therefore, it's imperative that you know, a political elite would then say, this is a BRI project, even if it is not a BRI project, right? And, and why they are doing that is because they perceive that we might be able to get more funding if we call something a BRI project, even if it is not a BRI project. I'll give you an example. So the president of Zimbabwe, the current one, he says he is implementing socialism with Zimbabwean characteristics. Why would he word it like that? Because for him, he wants to speak the language that China, the latest language that China is speaking, so that he, China thinks that he's more aligned to them and therefore he can get more benefit out of it. So there's a calculating thinking in, in, in how something is, is rebranded, BRI, if, even if it is not. And, and, and I think it's important who is actually rebranding these things. And, and why they are rebranding it, and whether there is a change when it was before it was a BRI project, and now that it has been rebranded by whoever rebranded it, a BRI project, what has been the change? Yeah, well, for me personally, I think this issue who is rebranding it is very important. And observe in some European cases, I don't want to mention which cases. It's very interesting. Uh, in recent years, we know there are more scrutiny from the European Union, also EU member states about Chinese investment. So initially some PRI rebranded BI project and the, the people who rebranded realized th this is going to become a problem for the European Union or for their member state. So they decided to, to not call it BI again. You know, so th this is quite interesting. Yeah, um, apparently Africa hasn't run into this issue yet. <laughs> All right, any more questions from our audience? Uh, yeah, please. You, 
Yes. Sorry, right. if I, I, I may comment it to Obe. Yes. I'll give again a case of Tanzania, which I know best because I'm from Tanzania. And I have been working for Bagamoyo project. And by the time China came with the Bagamoyo project, we had another agreement with China to construct the central railway line into a standard gauge railway. But the question is, why should we call Bagamoyo BRI, but the standard gauge railway never rebranded as BRI? So I think there is something more than just rebranding. Re and it is the same country, the same government, but one project is rebranded, another one is not rebranded. And I think for Frank, who had been working on the Bagamoyo, we know that the design by Bagamoyo was to connect Bagamoyo port with the central railway line plus Tazara plus the Northern Corridor Road trunk road. So why are we rebranding one aspect, but not the other? And uh, as scholars, what should we say about it? Any response for our panelists here? I have um, I have a response on that in terms of the rebranding. So I think part of it is also we also need to look who the partners are, right? So in terms of the Bagamoyo part and the Standard Gold Railway, this is two different Chinese partners and Chinese, sorry Chinese companies that are involved. So in terms of um, of Chinese officials and um, high level management within Chinese state-owned companies, there is also a need at times to rebrand projects into BRI because there are certain numbers and certain amounts of funds that need to be used into Belt and Road Initiative projects uh, each specific financial year. So this could be one of the, of the reasoning behind that. Um, in terms of China Merchants Park as well, this project, they had started negotiating the Bagamoyo Park project well before the Belt and Road Initiative. You're absolutely correct on that. Um, however, the rebranding came, uh, at least according to my interviewees in Hong Kong, it came as a surprise to them as well. Um, so this is definitely something that I wouldn't put on the company specifically, or you know, according to my interviewees, it didn't uh, really come from them. Um, so in this case, it might be a political decision to try and leverage some sort of historical connection uh, between Tanzania and China or to revive uh, some sentiment of a, of a broader picture. Um, but the difference between the, the, the railway and the Bagamoyo Power Project, I would argue that it's different stages of completion and it's also different uh, setting out with the project. So obviously there's a broader corridors that are part of it. And the fact that the Bagamoyo Power Project would eventually be linked to the railway, it's something that um, it is uh, quite far from implementation uh, since the port is also currently stalled as you uh, you know know better than everyone else here since you work on the project. Um, and so this is definitely you know very different um, circumstances around it and different needs of different people uh, in specific uh, state and non-state actors. Thank you. Uh, Cora, you want to make further comments? We are having kind of time running out, but... Yeah, I, okay. I wanted to make further comments. Okay, sure. The, the rail line was to be implemented by Chinese company from the money from China. China was ready to, to give through Exim Bank 7.6 billion US dollar. The, the port is 10, 10 billion US dollar which the difference is like three point something. So on the question of amount, I'm a bit worried. On the question of who is implementing, I'm yet, I'm again worried. Because even the Dar es Salaam port in one World Bank project was called PRI, while it was being financed by DFY, uh, uh, um, UK, uh, UK aid project. But in some project, in some reports, is branded BRI. So I think there is something fishy, maybe related to rebranding each project where we find Chinese as a BRI. Fun thing, the Central Railway Line currently there is Chinese contractors constructing the parts, the slot five from Mwanza to somewhere called Isaka, and Chinese firm have won that tender. 
but there is no naming because from Dar es Salaam to Dodoma is being implemented by Yat Mackenzie, which is a Turkish uh, firm. So I think we, 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 we need to, to, to maybe to, to track the evolution of rebranding or project, which might be another good study to understand China behavior towards Africa and or something like that. That could be my last comment on that. Thank you, Conrad. Um, I see that in the chat there is a question, perhaps this is directed for Maria. And the question says, how much national master planning attention is given to environmental sustainability in BRI projects? As time is running out, I wonder if Maria can help answer this, because uh, this seems to be related to your talk. So there is actually increasingly concern about the uh, sustainability of, uh, of um, China BRI projects. And uh, as, as I discussed also in the, in the paper, uh, there's also an increased number of guidance and regulations that are issued by Chinese central government to make sure that the BRI uh, projects uh, and the projects made by Chinese economic actors abroad are uh, environmentally sustainable. Um, and also, this is, is, um, is also kind of uh, complemented by Chinese banks. So China Development Bank, China Exim Bank, and also other banks that are really the leader in uh, financing these projects. Because it's not really AIIB that finance all these projects, uh, but are China policy banks. And these policy banks, we, we can see that in the past uh, few years, they started issuing uh, greening financing. Uh, thing so it, it is a concern then of course there is also always a question whether this is actually implemented so this is a big big problem that I also emphasized in in the paper uh, but uh, there is definitely concern awareness of the importance of uh, having uh, building sustainable uh, projects abroad and make sure to make uh, uh, Chinese economic actors more accountable especially state-owned enterprises. Private actors is difficult, but yeah, there is definitely this, uh, this sense of, of the importance of, of 